Goffman here. Um, today I'm going to stray a little bit from language learning. I'm going to talk about mobile learning and the fact that there is apparently a move afoot by um, UNESCO to develop some guidelines for mobile learning. And the reason I know that is because I'm on this listserv of English teachers, which is a um, community of English teachers who send out emails on topics. And the topic that they're talking about now is this uh, UNESCO, UNESCO guideline for mobile learning. Before I get into that, uh, let me just say that uh, I played golf today. It was a beautiful day here in Vancouver. Uh, three evenings ago, we had guests over, so my wife made gravad lax, which is this uh, Scandinavian salmon, in which, uh, and she always makes mm, far more than we ever need. So we've been eating the gravad lax for three days, and she made a tausi kai, which is uh, black bean chicken, and then she made a risotto with that. And so for the last three days, we've been eating this... Um, Gravad Lux, the uh, Dausi Guy Risotto, and she also made a tat tatin, which is a French upside down uh, apple pie. So we've been eating, eating that for three days. And of course, with the Gravad Lux, you have to have a little bit of, uh, of Danish aquavit. So, um, you know, we've had the same um, essentially diet for three days, but it's very delicious and uh, it's, it's lovely. Now, uh, UNESCO, mobile learning. So UNESCO wants to have some kind of guidelines for mobile learning. You know, when I saw that, I said to myself, like if there's one place where we don't need UNESCO, it's in mobile learning. Everything useful that's going to happen in mobile learning is going to come from individuals, teachers, entrepreneurs, learners, people who are going to be developing the technological aspects of it, the pedagogical aspects of it, the social interaction aspects of it. Link is one example of mobile learning. Uh, and, and you've got the creativity of people creating MP3 players. And I'm sure that in, in countries like India and China, they'll come up with cheaper versions of this. And if everything has to conform to some kind of UNESCO guidelines, well, first of all, it won't happen. The only thing that will happen is that there will be a lot of people employed at UNESCO and a lot of their favorite consultants will be get fat contracts to do studies on stuff that is all essentially useless. And, you know, it is time that we, we had a revolution in education. Uh, you know, if you read back in history in the 17th century, a, a the you know predominant you know source of GNP in the country was the court of Louis XIV or of whoever it might be. I mean, uh, half the manufacturing in the country, one way or another, was to supply the the court and the nobles and all these people. Um, and today, a significant percent of our GNP goes to supply bureaucrats and officials and people who travel the world attending conferences or travel within the country attending conferences and put out papers which they translate and, and it's all useless mostly. I shouldn't say all but overwhelmingly useless uh, and what it does is it dramatically increases the cost of education, it increases the burden, the public debt of countries and we're all laboring, most countries are laboring under this very large public debt because they're feeding an inflated public service that has, uh, you know, uh, is far larger than it needs to be and typically with entitlements that it shouldn't have and we need to start saying no. Education is very important if we're looking at economic growth, if we're looking at what people want in life, uh, you know, they're not going to want 15 cars per family. People don't want necessarily more material things, although perhaps in India and China they do, but in the developed world they don't. But people want uh, entertainment, they want education, they want um, computer programs, they want a lot of this sort of soft um, products, uh, Facebook, iPhone, you name it. And this is, this, this is where innovation is going to kick in. It's not going to kick in. Yes, there will be some innovation affecting 
how we create energy. There'll be innovation uh, coming up with better building materials and, and so forth and so on, and that's fine. But there's this enormous sector, which right now is dominated by the public sector, education, health, and so forth. Whether we choose to fund education or health publicly or not, that's a different issue. And I am largely in favor of funding education and health publicly so that everyone has a chance. However, the delivery of these services should be deregulated. You know, uh, it's like when I try to interest someone in the uh, language uh, teaching industry in, in, you know, the internet as a model for language learning. Well, you know, who, what are the credentials of your teachers? Uh, what system do you, what pedagogical system do you use? It doesn't matter. People will learn. People will learn when it comes to languages. Of course, if you're training engineers and you're building bridges and houses and you have to meet certain standards and stuff, that's one thing. But if you're talking about enriching people's lives through education, let, let people be free to educate themselves through reading, through whatever initiatives, whether it be, uh, you know, the Khan Academy uh, in the United States or everything, this, this is, it's, it's got to be a, 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 a wide open field for individuals, entrepreneurs, learners, teachers to, to develop without having to conform to some kind of a UNESCO imposed guideline. Wow, when I saw that, I said, boy, there's a completely useless boondoggle. Anyway, I just thought I would uh, let off some steam. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.